Uh, so the next speaker, yeah, the next speaker is uh, Evgeny Lakharo, and uh, his title is uh, "Find Properties of Steady Water Waves." Yeah, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to give a talk here. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to organizers for inviting me. I'm going to talk about the very, very classical problem uh, on uh, irritation of steady water waves in two dimensions. So it's a very old problem, uh, but still we can prove some uh, new interesting results about that. So uh, I will consider uh, traveling waves in two dimensions. So uh, here we have a surface profile uh, separating the water region from the air. Uh, and we have uh, traveling waves uh, propagating with any change of shape. So the shape is constant and the wave profile is traveling, say, in, in the right direction with constant speed c. So the surface profile is a, a graph of function eta, and it's not a restriction, it's not an assumption, it's always uh, true for irrotational waves. And A here is the amplitude. So uh, basic question, uh, which is interesting, uh, uh, is, uh, is there any relation between the amplitude and the speed in general for arbitrary solutions? And uh, today I will explain how one can actually obtain a general bound for the amplitude in terms uh, of the square of the speed with some absolute constant B. And this is interesting result and is uh, related to some uh, very sharp uh, inequalities uh, related to the Benjamin and Lyell conjecture. And I will mention, and I will explain a little bit later what that is. So this is what we're going to prove today. Uh, so uh, this result somehow, uh, so there, uh, there are some numerical uh, studies from uh, 70s and one with, by Thomas, for example. Uh, so uh, Thomas computed uh, different periodic solutions. Uh, and these are points here in this diagram. So uh, he computed the amplitude uh, over the mean depth and on the bottom, it's uh, the square of the speed over GH, where G is the gravitational constant. And you can see that there is a tangent line according to his computations. And that exactly means that the amplitude is bounded by this constant B, which is the slope uh, to the square of the speed over G. So this is something uh, uh, confirmed numerically already in the 70s. So the structure of the talk will be the following. So I will explain the mathematical model, uh, what the flow force constant is, which is because it's very important uh, in this analysis. Then I will uh, tell you about the measurement and Lyell conjecture and some new results about that. And then I will prove the main uh, result. So now the water wave problem. So for two-dimensional traveling waves, uh, we have the following system of equations, which you might be familiar with. Uh, so uh, we have a velocity field in physical variables u and v. And in the moving reference frame where the uh, wave is stationary, we have relative velocity field u minus c, where c is the speed of the wave. So we have uh, Euler equations inside the fluid. Uh, we have equation, uh, incompressibility equation, and uh, the absence of uh, vorticity equation. Vorticity equation. Here we assume that the flow uh, is irritation. Plus we have boundary conditions, uh, uh, one a and one c here, and the constant q here is called total height. So this system of equations can be formulated in, a, in, a, in an easier way uh, in terms of stream function psi, uh, which is defined implicitly from the relation for the gradient of psi uh, this way. And then the system is much simpler. We have one Laplace equation inside the fluid. We have uh, Dirichlet boundary condition on the bottom. Uh, 
uh, and the bottom is at level y equals to zero. Uh, the surface is the graph of function eta. We have the Bernoulli equation uh, and uh, mass flux uh, uh, equation. So psi, function psi, must be constant on the surface. And m is uh, mass flux. So here we need to... Uh, 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 excuse me, uh, in 1c, uh, it should, uh, should it be uh, square? Yes, yes, it's a typo. It shall be square. Yes, thank you. Thanks. So now we will uh, uh, introduce non-dimensional variables uh, and rescale, basically we rescale the mass flux and the gravitational constant uh, to the unity. We obtain uh, problem for function capital psi. So it's the same problem, but in non-dimensional variables. So uh, it's convenient because now we have a fixed uh, mass flux on the uh, fixed boundary condition on the surface. Then we introduce a very important quantity, which is called flow force constant. It's uh, introduced in terms of, uh, as an integral, an integral quantity in terms of the stream function and the Bernoulli constant R here. Oh, sorry. And uh, this is uh, actually some uh, constant which is independent of x, even so it's, uh, it depends on x in the definition. And this is important and it can be thought as a Hamiltonian for steady waves where the time is the x variable. Uh, so for this problem, we have several classical, somewhat classical solutions. Uh, these are Stokes waves, basic periodic solutions, uh, solitary waves with only one uh, crest uh, and decaying at infinity. We have uh, extreme uh, Stokes and solitary waves uh, with stagnation points uh, at crests where the angle is 120 degrees. So we already know about that waves from the talk of Vladimir Kozlov from yesterday. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so these are the ways I will be mentioning this talk. Uh, today, we you can think that we are considering uh, in the, for for, the, for today we are going to work mainly with Stokes waves. So there are trivial solutions for the problem as well, and the trivial solutions they are independent of x variable, and we can compute them explicitly. It's very simple. But what is uh, what important here is that we have different depths and we can classify all trivial solutions into subcritical with depths greater than one and supercritical solutions with depths uh, less than one. So uh, then we can compute uh, flow force constants for the corresponding subcritical uh, solutions and supercritical and we denote them by S plus minus minus. So uh, basically the difference between subcritical and supercritical solutions is that all periodic solutions, they are uh, defined by subcritical flows. And all solitary waves, they, they exist only for over supercritical flows. So that's the difference. Uh -huh. Yes. So now the Benjamin and Lytle conjecture from 1954 uh, is about uh, the all possible uh, parameter value, values of parameters uh, R and flow force S for steady waves. So uh, we can uh, compute flow force constants for all uh, trivial solutions, and that gives us the boundary of this region. So uh, the boundary consists of two curves, uh, one is red and one is blue, uh, corresponding to subcritical flows and supercritical. So it's a cuspidal region like that. So here we also have some curve of extreme waves uh, approaching two extreme solitary waves somewhere here. And the conjecture is that any steady motion, non-trivial uh, motion, uh, if we compute the flow force constant uh, and the Bernoulli constant and uh, put a point, draw a point uh, in this RS plane, it will be inside this cuspidal region. Okay, so they also conjecture that it might be one-to-one -one correspondence, but it's, uh, we know that it's not true. But uh, nevertheless, uh, so yeah, the main part of the conjecture is that uh, all steady solutions correspond to inner points of this region. So there is some history of the problem. 
So uh, in an analytic way, the conjecture can be written as an equality for the flow force constant. So it, it, it's bounded by S minus for uh, supercritical flow and S plus for subcritical trivial flow, laminar flow. Uh, where R is the same thermodynamic constant as for the solution. So uh, there are several results uh, on this problem, uh, and uh, I will mention so you can see here. The one which is important is the result by benching from 95 uh, to prove the conjecture for both inequalities here for irrotational stock space. So uh, it was, uh, there were different extensions of that by uh, Vladimir Kozlov and Nikolai Kuznetsov, uh, and later by uh, me and Vladimir and Nikolai. And uh, uh, there are also some interesting questions uh, related to the equalities. So what Benjamin proved is that these inequalities, they hold, uh, they are not, we don't know if uh, they are strict or not for any non-trivial solution. The case of equalities is very interesting as well. So it's a separate problem uh, in a sense. And we can ask if, if we have a solution, some non-trivial solution or just a solution, and we know that the flow force constant is one of those, can we say that it's a trivial solution? And uh, it's a very deep question, in fact, because, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the first question is uh, related to the existence of, uh, for example, possible existence of multi-crested solitary weights or one-sided uh, bores and solitary weights. And a partial answer to that was given in a recent paper by Vladimir Kozlov, uh, myself, and Miles Wheeler. Uh, on non-existence of subcritical solitary waves. So we, uh, uh, we prove that there are no solitary waves satisfying this equality S equals to S plus. In, but geometrically, it means that there, there, there are no multi-crest solitary waves to participate. So, and the idea there was, uh, uh, there, there was a new idea of uh, flow force flux functions. And this idea was developed later by myself uh, uh, which resulted in a proof uh, of uh, general form of the Benjamin Lycan conjecture, where the case of equalities was also analyzed. So it was true that if S equals to S plus, then we have a stream set, trivial solution. And if S equals to S minus, then we also have either a classical solitary wave or a trivial solution. So, so complete uh, proof of the Benjamin and Lycan conjecture. So the conjecture is very important for our uh, uh, for this problem on the bounds of the amplitude. Uh, I will explain how, and that's related to the question uh, about uh, uh, the following one. So does it, every point in this region correspond to a steady wave? So, uh, and the answer it, it was known that the answer is no. So more or less the boundary is not exactly this dashed curve corresponded to extreme waves, but something close to that. But in fact, uh, in the irritational case, we can prove something uh, way better. So we can prove very explicit bound for the uh, uh, lower, lower bound, much better than inequality as uh, greater than S minus. And the bound uh, is explicit, so it corresponds to the curve uh, R squared over two. And then the cuspidal region is uh, reduced to a much smaller domain, which is as, uh, where this curves S plus of R and R squared over two, they are asymptotically close. So it's a very uh, thin region. And this is very important, as we will see later. And now I will explain how we can prove this uh, in another new bound. It's quite uh, simple, in fact. So for this purpose, we need to introduce, uh, like following the definition of the flow force constant, we can introduce flow force function where we just replace the uh, limit of integration by variable y with the same quantity inside. And then this function, it solves a similar elliptic problem uh, with free boundary. And we basically, we want to estimate the r, uh, the possible value for r in terms of s. So we want to obtain a bound for R here. 
And this can be done as, uh, as for like waterways with persistent impact. So we consider all trivial solutions to this problem that are uh, dependent on the y variable for a fixed path. And we also uh, use this uh, additional constraint that the y derivative shall be uh, positive because it's true for the flow force functions for irrotational waves. And then if we compute uh, solutions explicitly, we see that the maximum value of r is bounded by square root of 2s. As simple as that. And then we can actually prove that the same bound is valid for all non trivial functions. And it can be proved just the same way as in the paper by Vladimir and Kaslov, Nikolai Kuznetsov, and myself from 2015. And then we can show that this bound is also true for the Bermuda constant here, uh, Bermuda constant R, for any, for arbitrary solution. And then we have this inequality r less than square root of 2s, and which is equivalent to that s is greater than r square root 2, as we wanted. So now we have this new bound. And we're going to use this information in order to prove the inequality for the empty field. So we know that these two curves, plus and uh, this black one, uh, the new bound, uh, they are asymptotically closed because we can compute as plus as follows. So the next term is decaying, which is very important. And we will use this to prove the inequality for the amplitude of this form. So the amplitude and zeta is the surface profile in non-dimensional variables. It's bounded by one over r squared uh, with some absolute constant. And uh, to prove this, we are going to use some maximum principles and this uh, new information uh, about the bound for the flow force constant. So in, we introduce this function uh, small f. So it's flow force function minus s times string function. And if we write down the maximum principle and use the Hopf theorem on the bottom of the domain, we see that using the new bound, we see that psi y is almost like one over r, uh, one over r of the order. And here we use this new inequality for the flow force constant, which is very important. Without that, we wouldn't be able to do anything. And then we can introduce another function uh, where we have this uh, coefficient r over 4, which counts as the inverse quantity of the right hand side here. And then uh, we can show that uh, because of the inequality for the psi y, uh, this function attains maximum on the upper boundary where it's constant. And then we can apply maximum principle and the Hopf theorem one more time. And we obtain differential inequality for the uh, surface profile. And this differential inequality is interesting because we have this minus term with uh, right coefficient, with the right order of the coefficient. And then if we play around with this inequality and use the fact that for Stokes waves, the slope is bounded by one, which is a well-known result, we can prove uh, the inequality for the amplitude of, of this form. And in physical variables, if we uh, translate it to physical variables from the beginning in, uh, with amplitude and the total hat, we obtain inequality of this type. So the amplitude uh, for the uh, in physical variables is bounded by some absolute constant to the square of the mass flux over the square of the total hat plus uh, times the rotational constant. The total hat is defined like, like that, and it's greater or equal always than the g times mean depth D and the mass flux we can estimate it from above by some uh, it's it shall be small c by the speed uh, because this quantity is positive uh, and uh, the mean depth again and then if we combine two inequalities we obtain the desired inequality for the amplitude so uh, that's the proof of the result and uh, yes. Uh, beside uh, this inequality for the amplitude, we find a very interesting uh, 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 another result is that uh, in this problem, if we consider so the problem for stream function psi, so here, if we consider uh, large values of R, then we always have uh, some extreme waves. 
extreme stock space. And we see that for large car, they must be because the amplitude is of order one over square, it, uh, they must be of small amplitude. So this is very interesting uh, result because normally uh, one, uh, when talking about extreme waves, one think about large amplitude solutions. But uh, we see that if the energy is, uh, uh, is big enough, then we have a small amplitude extreme waves. Yes, that's uh, all I wanted to uh, say. Uh, thank you very much for attention. Uh, for, for attention, and please uh, ask questions. Thank you. Questions. Uh, Shunya, and uh, wh what uh, do you know, and maybe what do you? Uh, 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 predict uh, for the uh, sharp value of this uh, B? Uh. Well, uh, sort of, uh, we do, uh, I mean, from my proof, it follows that it's something like 10. <laughs> but uh, if we take a look at this diagram, uh, some numerical results, we can see that it's more like something like two. As usual, if you have some uh, um, uh, some fundamental constant uh, which is dimensionless and uh, it depends on no nothing, uh, it is uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, what is this constant? Yeah, yeah. So I I, I don't think it's possible to compute it explicitly. I'm very sure about that uh, because it's very. You know, the problem is very nonlinear. So this constant is not achieved on extreme waves or something like that. So mm -hmm. I, just, I don't think you, we can compute it, but we can see from this numerical result from, by Thomas that it's more like two or something. Okay. Like or no, no, it's, uh, the scaling here is different. So it's one, uh, yeah, uh, it's more like eight. If one is here or seven, <laughs> something like that. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a question, may I? Yep. Yes, uh, in your problem, you have at least one parameter, this Q, and uh, how is uh, uh, the solution depends on the variation in this parameter? I mean, any continuous dependence on this constant, is this re relevant to your study? So, uh, you see, uh, so uh, indeed we have uh, here some uh, constant Q. Q, right. But for a given constant Q, and even given uh, uh, mass flux, there, uh, there are many solutions to the problem. So it's not unique. Yeah, okay, okay, but there is no local uniqueness at least, or I mean, no, there is... no, there, there, there is no, no. Okay, so you have bi bifurcation, the bifurcation and turning points. Yes, definitely. Thank you. And uh, can you extend this technique uh, for the case of Artistia? Well, it's very complicated because uh, partly yes. But in case of vorticity, the problem is a little bit different. And then uh, there, in many cases, uh, the constant Q is bounded a priori. And uh, so we shall formulate it in a different way. But uh, yeah, uh, in some cases, we can extend it to the vorticity and we can obtain some similar results. For some, uh, for example, constant positive vorticity, for instance. OK, thank you. It's time for next talk. Um, uh, excuse me, okay, yeah. Jenny, you uh, said that you uh, use uh, some uh, maximum principle somewhere. Yes. Uh, but uh, uh, maximum principle for what? Uh, for uh, solutions of elliptic problems with some boundary. No. Uh, at the end. Uh, you in, uh, said we introduce uh, some uh, strange thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah. the maximum principle for what? For this function, uh, G. Uh, for, for G. But the result is the inequality for zeta. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it follows from the Hopf lemma. So we uh, use the fact that G attains maximum at the boundary. And then we apply Hopf's lemma and obtain inequality for zeta. Ah, at the end of ah, the day. Okay, okay, yeah. Now, now I get, thank you. 
Okay, thank you again, and uh, next talk.